Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here this morning uh, during our webinar series. Uh, my name is Anna Siefgen. I'm the Executive Director for the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation at Carnegie Mellon University uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're very glad to have you as a part of our session this morning with our very distinguished guests. Um, before we get started, though, I wanted to uh, make a couple of announcements. The first is to remind everyone that we are being recorded today. Uh, this recording will be available on our website uh, probably later this afternoon, if not tomorrow, um, and very good for sharing um, as, the, uh, mm. as you would like. Um, I also want to acknowledge that uh, we have been uh, in very trying times. Um, the Scott Institute um, is keenly aware of all the things that are happening around us. When we started this series, it was specific to um, COVID-19 and the pandemic. And as things have progressed over the past few weeks, uh, we realized that disruption is all around us. So we just wanted to acknowledge not only our essential workers, our frontline workers, um, but all of those that are um, in, in crisis right now. So as we talk about infrastructure and energy, we keep that um, certainly at the center of our hearts and minds. So with that, I wanna get directly into our content this morning. So we are, as I mentioned, the Wilton E. Scott Institute for Energy Innovation, um, and we look at collaborative research, uh, partnerships, uh, we do public policy and outreach, um, education for our students and the community, as well as a strong thrust in uh, entrepreneurship and innovation with our startup community. So this series is a part of that effort, um, and the purpose is very specific. It's really to have informative dialogue um, on energy's impact uh, within COVID-19 and other disruptions. Um, and it's really to prepare for the future, which is why we talk about pivoting in 2020. So this is the fourth webinar in our series. I'm gonna show you a calendar of all of our upcoming webinars in a moment. Um, but I do wanna to mention today that we are talking about infrastructure and uh, that framework for uh, resilience in the future. So we are doing this webinar uh, twice a month um, and we have scheduled through August at this point. So um, next week we have a special session, hence the asterisk, um, that's focused on IP and patents and it's specifically for startups. So if you are a part of a startup or an investor in startups, uh, we have some partners from BAPS Caland and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory that are co-presenting that session with us. For utility planning, we are uh, talking with the three local utilities in Pittsburgh about the work that they're doing. And then we've added a new session that's coming up on July 9th, specific to energy access and inequity. Uh, we're talking with investors about startups on July 23rd, transportation energy with Konstantin Samaras, one of our faculty in August on the 6th, and batteries and storage with our own Jay Whitaker um, on August the 20th. So we hope that these uh, sessions are informative and helpful, uh, and we actively request um, ideas. Uh, just come forward, let us know what you're interested in hearing more about. So this morning, I wanna say a special thank you to not only Carnegie Mellon's uh, Nick Muller, who I'll introduce in a moment, um, but also the Smith Group and the City of Pittsburgh for their participation. Um, it, it goes without mention that Karina Ricks has been extremely busy this week, so we're so glad to have her with us. And with that, uh, let me give you a quick um, introduction to our um, esteemed panelists, and then we'll go back to um, having their pictures up. Uh, so Nick Muller is Associate Professor of Economics, Engineering, and Public Policy. He has joint appointments in the Tepper School of Business and the Department of Energy, excuse me, Engineering and Public, Public Policy, which we call EPP, at Carnegie Mellon. So Professor Muller's research lies at the intersection of environmental economics, engineering, and engineering. So much of his published work focuses on modeling air pollution and greenhouse gas damages from economic activity in the United States. Karina Ricks was formerly the Director of Transportation Planning for the District of Columbia before becoming the inaugural Director of the City of Pittsburgh's uh, Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, DOMI. The Department of Mobility and Infrastructure's purview includes design and implementation of a complete network, resiliency projects around landslides and flooding, policies and programs to manage emerging transportation, including shared services and autonomous vehicles, and strategies to address long-term sustainability. And our uh, final panelist is Katrina Kelly-Pitu, who's an economist and energy system strategist at Smith Group. 
She bridges together architects, planners, and engineers dealing with optimizing the social and environmental impacts of the built environment. So the Smith Group is one of the world's preeminent uh, integrated design firms. They work across a network of 15 offices in the US and China and a team of 1,300 experts who are committed to excellence in strategy, design, and delivery. And so with that, let me stop sharing my screen. And here we are. So as we get started this morning, thank you all again for being here. Um, please, if you have questions, uh, we welcome them. You can put them either in the Q&A or the chat, and we'll pick them up during uh, the course of the session. But I do want to start with sort of a bigger question. So for each of you, related to your organizations or your research, how has COVID-19 impacted your way of thinking about infrastructure planning, either energy systems, transportation, mobility, or otherwise? So why don't we start with you, Karina, um, and then Nick, and then Katrina. So I, I'm throughout, hopefully, both of UKs, I'm not going to say your names incorrectly today, but uh, Karina, if you'd like to start, and thank you again for being with us. No, thank you for, for having us. This is, um, you know, definitely an, an interesting time as we're dealing with sort of uh, uh, triple crises, I would say, um, the, the global climate um, crisis that we've been focused on for uh, a very long time, uh, the current health crisis uh, associated with COVID-19, and, and now, um, you know, a, a persistent but now well daylit crisis around racial inequity and opportunity. And so, um, the mission of the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure from our founding um, was to provide and is to provide the physical mobility necessary for the economic mobility of all Pittsburghers. Mm -hmm. And that's really how we orient our work. I don't know that these crises have, have changed um, our thinking or orientation other than really requiring us to recenter ourselves and think about how those investments, apologies for the, the noise in the background, uh, other than to re recenter our investments, really think about those impacts. We have five guiding goals um, that we organize ourselves around, which is, which is safety, first of all, that no one dies traveling on our city streets, but also those of equitable access, that everyone should be able to get to fresh fruits and vegetables uh, within 20 minutes travel of, of home, uh, and that they don't need to have a private automobile to do it. That's much easier said than done um, being able to, to buy your grocery, your, your ice cream and get home before it melts um, seems like a pretty low bar, but when we have infrequent transit service, when we have mobility, micro-mobility devices that are not capable of carrying um, a parent and child and groceries, um, when we have other kinds of restrictions on mobility, uh, when many of our jobs for our low-skill workers are um, far outside the city in places where it requires two or three or four transfers um, if you don't have private mobility. Um, these are the kinds of things that, again, um, all of these, these, these triple crises that we're looking at really require us to recenter and look at and analyze where we're putting um, now ever more precious infrastructure dollars, ever more precious uh, mobility investments. Thank you. So, Nick? Yeah. Uh, again, I'd echo Karina in saying thanks for the invite. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. These are important issues. Um, my answer will focus mostly on the, the COVID-19 crisis. And I would argue that the biggest really overarching takeaway is what this has revealed in terms of the fragility of our economic systems broadly and energy systems um, specifically. So one way that I would encourage our listeners to think about the, the economy is in terms of a perpetual motion machine or uh, a circular flow. And an example of that would be uh, an individual's income is expenditure on goods and services, which then in turn reflects revenue for firms, which firms then allocate to capital and uh, to labor. And labor then earns income and they spend income and that's expenditure and revenue. And so the whole machine uh, depends on that flow of resources. What we've seen over the last two and a half, three months, maybe more, is what happens when that machine stops. And uh, it stopped for a very severe uh, and sudden um, reason. But we see the, the near cataclysmic 
effects when that perpetual motion machine stops. With a particular example in mind, think about what's happened in markets for oil and derivative products like gasoline and diesel. Um, when the demand for personal and business travel fell by significant amounts, the repercussion in those markets was sudden and was severe. You know, for the first time in history, we saw oil futures close in the U.S. in, in negative territory in April. It was like minus $40 a barrel. And the repercussions then are in terms of physical investment. There are no new drilling rigs uh, being set up. In terms of uh, social impacts where workers are being laid off, and that then feeds back through into the communities that are dependent on these industries for, uh, for that flow of, res of resources. And so to me, as I said at the beginning of my answer, this, this has really been a lesson about a lack of resilience and a, a fundamental fragility in, in much of our economic system. Katrina. Great. Well, again, thank you for having me today. Um, it's, I'm conscious as someone who works in resilience, how unique of a moment it is to be on a call with both Nick and Karina, especially during such a time. It, it's quite timely, if you will. It's, I think whenever we're talking about the thinking and planning and kind of the paradigm shifts that we're trying to understand um, if, these, if the crises that we've been experiencing lately are going to be kind of short-term repercussions or long-term changes, and how we really attack, um, you know, building and even interacting with communities it is something that I think we're wrestling with in the private sector right now. Um, as someone who works in resilience really broadly, I think what um, we've really emphasized at Smith Group is that it's important to make sure resilience planning is really business as normal. It's important to really make sure that you're internalizing a lot of the externalities that aren't included as business as normal. Um, but if you really can take a really proactive I think um, lens and really identify how the designs that you're working in can cause also positive repercussions with communities can be um, further inclusive in the types of goals that we're trying to further with our belt environment. It's really um, the crises that we've gone through have put emphasis on just that exact fragility that Nick was commenting on. Um, as someone who really works in climate change, I think that I'm conscious of the time spectrum and I think climate scientists have largely been you know, really encouraging people to, to think about the changes that we need to make urgently. So I think the crises that we've been experiencing just in the past couple of weeks has, have really just emphasized that we can't really wait for kind of the market to, to let these changes happen. What we actually see is now that we have to be really thoughtful and really intentional, if you will, about making sure that the changes that we're making now in our communities are the ones that are going to help prepare them for the long term. So uh, the second question, and it, it, many of your comments sort of brought this to mind. So, so what infrastructure, I'm going to call them things, infrastructure things, um, both temporary and permanent, do you think are going to change because of the pandemic? What are some things that we had before that we might not have again, or, or ways that we might be thinking about things differently? So um, Nick, why don't you start this one? And then I think Katrina and obviously Karina, please jump in. So I would, I would open my answer by saying, um, I, I don't know, honestly. And this is really, really a, a tough and important question to, to ask and to think carefully about as, as we answer from multiple perspectives, private, public, and, and uh, academic sectors. Um, one thing I think we've learned that uh, may be enduring, uh, if not permanent, is that some fraction of the tasks that we do be they uh, work or personal, um, can be done remotely. Not all of them, but some of them can be. And you know, I think uh, good examples of this are uh, meetings that we might have flown to or conferences that we might have flown to um, across the country or, or across an ocean to participate in live, to, to give a talk, to witness a talk, to, to interact and network. Um, for the last three months, obviously, in, in most cases, certainly not all cases, that's been replaced by remote interactions. I mean, look at us right here, right now. Some fraction of that, I believe, firms, universities, uh, governmental bodies are going to realize that they can economize by not flying people all over the place 
And by achieving some degree, if not a perfect substitute, some degree of uh, substitutability in the, the value of those interactions. All of the conferences that I would have gone to in the last two months and all of them scheduled this summer are all remote. And people are just as psyched about giving a paper and about witnessing a paper. Um, the, the human interactions, you know, the coffee hours, the, the cocktail hours, those won't occur, of course. But I think we've learned that some non-trivial fraction of our economic activity and interactions won't depend in the future on consumption of fossil fuels to transport us around. And I think if there's an enduring piece of this, it will be, it will be that change in behavior that seems, that seems feasible. How that relates to infrastructure, um, I would say we, we might in the long run, as we think about um, you know, repairs and or new investments in infrastructure, we might have enduring capacity changes, either in, in roads or rail or air hubs. I'm frankly not sure, but that would be one way that that fundamental change, which I think some fraction of will last, could then feed in through to the infrastructure systems. Yeah, I think that your your question actually kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit, which is, you know, infrastructure to me is much more than just the technical solutions that we we kind of tend to approach resilience projects with. Um, I think Karina's title is even just a little bit more inclusive of how we can view infrastructures in a much more systemic manner, which I think is really appropriate and desperately needed today. If we can kind of move away from this idea that we can engineer our way out of um, every problem, if you will, and really move towards just a, a smarter understanding of what are the technical, the socioeconomic, and the environmental infrastructures that we really need to not only um, build for the, our long-term sustainability again, but in really revisit in ways to understand how they can immediately heal some of the more systemic vulnerabilities that we're seeing across cities today, I think is really the crux of the solution. I think Nick really highlighted his point there that it's not just about uh, the technical changes that, that we need to be making throughout these infrastructure solutions, but we really need to have a strong focus and understanding as to what the social um, sort of dimension is, what are the true behavioral changes that, that we need to, to really understand and highlight in terms of systemic change. Yeah, and I, yeah I mean, I think that we, there is an imperative that we remain laser focused um, on what is happening across the whole spectrum um, of people in our communities during this time. Um, we on this panel are a very privileged group. I think we need to go ahead and acknowledge that. Uh, we have the luxury of uh, digital technology that allows us to have conversations like this. We have the luxury of being able to go to quiet rooms or in my case, somewhat quiet outdoors um, uh, in order to have conversations like this. Um, we perhaps have the luxury of someone else to take care of our children um, or that we have older children that are able to self-manage because they have other digital uh, connections or other kinds of things like that. If we are not absolutely crystal clear about uh, those who are able to continue, uh, somewhat continue a form of normal life uh, in this pandemic and those that are becoming more and more remote and more and more segregated, um, we are setting ourselves up for the kind of social inequity that we've never seen before or haven't seen, um, you know, in a hundred years um, in this country. So we really need to be careful and understand that uh, I see one of the commenters uh, mentions digital infrastructure and um, uh, fiber communications. Absolutely. We need to get that right. We need to get that to every community in every corner of our city right now, but we also need to make sure that they have the devices um, that they can then use that connectivity uh, um, to do things. I think that we'll see more and more, which is a wonderful thing from a, from a sustainability standpoint, we'll see uh, much more sort of potting, if that's a word, uh, of communities kind of coming um, within a smaller geographic area of each other where our neighborhoods really start to become um, our complete communities again, um, which is great. Perhaps, you know, even in the workforce, you know, where we do have face to face meetings um, or those kinds of things that will happen uh, on a very small geographic area. That is great from a sustainability standpoint. In a city like Pittsburgh, we are profoundly segregated. That means that those pods are solely African American and solely uh, white or, or uh, of different ethnic groups. So 
we really need to be conscious of what is happening here. And as we're rebuilding this infrastructure for greater resiliency, um, we need to think it through all the way. There are jobs that simply cannot be done remotely. There are jobs that can be done remotely, but the rest of the support system that's necessary um, for those people, my assistant, for example, is a single mother, you know, she is not as connected over the last three months um, as she once was when we lived and worked in an in-person environment. I don't want to continue, continue the rant, but we need to sort of look back at the challenges that we faced when we went from sort of a cash economy to more of a digitally paid economy. And those people that were left out and continue to be left out because they don't really operate in, uh, they still operate very much on a cash transaction basis. We're doing the same thing, but now that transaction mechanism is digital communications. So I, I want to thank Karen Lightman, who's the uh, executive director of our Smart Cities Institute at CMU for that, that great question about digital, which is really important. Um, we have a couple of other questions coming in. If, if when you all have a question, do put it in the Q&A. It's a little bit easier for me to track. I see another question that's come in. Uh, we're, sure to get, we're going to get to in a couple of minutes from Don Kofelt, one of our other colleagues at CMU. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, work and personal travel, mobility. We haven't really touched on delivery, um, but can you talk a little about the short-term effects that we're going to see um, and that we have already seen through some of the research, Nick, for example, your research? Um, and will we be looking at lasting uh, effects of, in, in terms of air quality, energy, et cetera? Nick, hoping you might start with that one. Super. So um, together with colleagues at um, a couple of universities across the U.S., we have just released a working paper that was asking a couple really simple questions. Um, given the large and significant changes in mobility, primarily through personal vehicle use, and uh, also reductions in power generation, again, in the US, uh, we were wondering what the effects of those changes have been on air quality, ad ad admittedly temporary, unless some of the changes that we were talking about in response to the last question become more enduring. Um, and what we found was that in particular in large U.S. cities, the reductions in fine particulate matter concentrations have been considerable. Uh, just as a, a way to, to bracket the changes that we're talking about, we know from cell phone data, which again, doesn't cover everybody, um, personal mobility was down on the order of 40 to 50 percent from the beginning of March to the end of April and power generation on net was down more like five to 15%, depending on where you are in the country. The reductions in ambient particulate matter that were associated with those changes in mobility and energy use and power generation were on the order of preventing 350 deaths per month in the US. And it's important to recognize that many of those premature deaths as a function of differential baseline health status would be among disadvantaged communities. So these were significant improvements. Now, what lessons do we learn from that? We're certainly not arguing that lockdowns are a good thing. What we are arguing is that movements away from extremely energy intensive ways to move around and carbon and pollution, air pollution intensive ways to make power uh, are things that we can, we can reduce and there are real benefits to doing that. Katrina. Yeah, so I tend to, um, at the moment, work more on a, I guess, a local level or a city level, especially whenever it comes to uh, really the side of uh, energy demand, if you will. So it's been interesting, I think, um, looking at really the, the short-term dips that Nick has pointed to, but being able to also like really dig into that data a little bit and understand what types of patterns that we've seen emerge. Um, I think for me, you know, the, the head or the mind space that I automatically go to is a little bit of uh, buildings and kind of the overall built environment and how much they're using energy. And we definitely did see a, a bit of a dip initially um, that was probably that we thought was really related to people being able to work from home and kind of a shift from these large intense energy buildings. But actually, um, as we've seen the really the weather get quite nicer, honestly, um, you've seen a lot of that demand actually increase again. So for me, this kind of points to the, the need to further decouple really our 
hardcore economic activities from actually the energy intensity that they represent. I have a suspicion that perhaps a lot of the, the power fluctuations themselves were more related to weather patterns than they were actually to the behavioral patterns um, they, that we've seen happen look, at, look on a local basis here. So I think whenever um, we're talking about, you know, what are the, what are the long-term impacts that we see happening? I think I would probably pivot the question a little bit and say, what are the long-term impacts that we hope that, that these types of, that COVID especially has caused in our changes? Not to be redundant on behavioral change, but to me, this is just really pointed to the importance of it as well too, right? If you're going to continue lighting buildings and continue cooling them when people aren't in them, it's in vice versa, if, you're, if your residential bill is going to say the same even when you're at work, what we can actually look at from a data perspective is understanding that actually your devices are probably still on whenever you're going to work, right? That the buildings are still being heated and cooled for critical infrastructure purposes, even when we're not in them. So to me, it just shows the importance of really digging down into the nitty gritty of truly what is the interaction with people like in our inter, inter, in regards to infrastructures and how can we just be more intentional about understanding how people interact with infrastructures, but also making sure that they're doing, they we're making sure inter, infrastructures themselves interact in the positive ways that also communities need. Um, Karen's question, I think, really highlights it as well, too. And, you know, something that I know that we've been going back and forth in Twitter over Twitter in regards to is seeing specifically where that intensity of um, network vulnerabilities are in, in certain communities in Pittsburgh. It's directly correlated to, um, for, for instance, the areas that I think are the ones that we really need to focus on strengthening um, over the next few months and years. Just a quick clarifying point, the reductions in power production and, and mobility were with respect to multi-year averages, they were not due to weather. Um, Karina, any yeah. comments on that? And we do have questions coming in. So thank you, please send those through the Q&A. Thank you. Um, I, I'll leave the, the, the long-term modeling uh, to the researchers. Uh, appreciate uh, that work, but I'll just sort of give one um, sort of data point that I think is is worth carefully considering, which is we are just now beginning to uh, resume the green phase uh, where telework is still strongly encouraged. Um, most uh, people that can telework are continuing to telework. Um, and even so, we have seen an 80% resumption in vehicle traffic. So vehicle traffic volumes, even under this condition, are back up to 80% of what they once were. And I don't have the latest information um, from our transit authority, but I believe that their ridership is still down uh, 70%. So they have about 30% of the ridership that they once had while we still have 80% of the vehicle traffic volumes. So that is a bad trend line um, for long-term um, resumption of activity. So we actually have two questions that have come in uh, related to transportation. So I, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of blend these two together. So one is talking about the offsetting forces at work between remote working opportunities, a reticence to use public transportation that you've just mentioned, preference for, for private vehicles, and how do we think these will ultimately balance within the transportation sector? And then the second question, which is related, which is, will public transportation have to use more buses to carry fewer people in the short and medium term to limit exposure? And how do we prioritize routes in a time of diminished resources? So again, we are, uh, these are touching in transportation, which I know, uh, Karina, is within your portfolio, although we have the, the, the uh, Port Authority um, handling many of those things. But do you have comment on either of those transportation related questions? Yeah, I mean, I think as with everything else in this time, it, you know, this really prompts us to dramatically rethink uh, what these systems are and what the alternatives um, to them are. So San Francisco, uh, I really, you know, look at what they did during this pandemic and, and they took a system that carried 100,000 people a day and in four days redesigned it to maintain only 14 routes in all of the, the city of San Francisco. Granted, there's MTA and there's BART and there's other services there as well, but uh, of the local SFMTA services, they pared that down to just 14 routes. And those were the 14 routes that served people that did not have any other mobility options available to them. Um, and so really focusing on, 
know what is going on in my neighborhood. Um, really focusing on um, that kind of what is the need, what is the problem that, that transit is uh, servicing, making sure that those people who really have no other mobility options are able to um, get those services. Running more buses with fewer people is not financially sustainable. Transit is, is, is a subsidized activity and we should all be, be proud and happy that it is because it provides that essential mobility that we need. Um, but, but that might not be the long-term answer that we can, can continue to hold. We need to figure out where are those service areas for which this is the social safety net that we must provide so that they can better themselves and achieve those kind of necessary trips that they need to make. And then what can my department and other departments do um, to change behavior to Katrina's point um, for those who do have mobility choices, who do have mobility options so that we're steering those choices toward more sustainable options and perhaps cross subsidizing uh, using their, their, their transportation expenses, which they are uh, more able to absorb um, to offset those costs for the people in our, in our community that uh, cannot bear a greater transportation burden than they already have. So how should we be thinking about aligning sort of the public and private in terms of impact and maybe even financial implications? How should we be making those decisions? Um, Katrina, do you want to start there? Yeah, sure. I think that, um, you know, it's, a, it's actually a great time to, to be thinking more proactively in terms of the private sector and how we can really, I think, partner with cities by, um, you know, the broad, broader, not, I guess, public sector institutions and really help solving the gaps that I think are needed. Um, as Karina alluded to, you know, we know that there's a large stress um, that is happening financially to cities, especially as we're going through um, the crisis, and that's only set to continue. So I think um, the, the role of really public-private partnerships and being intentional about solving the problems that not just the cities, but the people who live within them need is a is really ripe room, um, probably for collaboration. You know, on the other hand, I tend to view this at times from almost like a European perspective where we get really excited about the options for um, new financial instruments to become available also, which are things related to, I think, principles of responsible investment, specifically looking at the role of climate bonds in filling these solutions. So I think as we go forward, hopefully um, what can happen in, in the next few years or so is really taking concrete definitions of what we need the performance of infrastructures to be so that as private sector, we can, we can design around those goals. Um, Nick, would you like to answer that one too? Sure. Just uh, briefly, I would I would um, offer that the point about San Francisco's redesign is a really really great point. Right, thinking about how can we maximize the benefit of a public system like buses or trains or or just broadly the the public transportation network. I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, the 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 other thing I'd say though, is with respect to the trend lines and the rebound in sort of individual vehicle use underscores the need for us to continue as a country um, to reduce the social cost of transportation period. And so that means not rolling back fuel economy standards. It means exploring alternative vehicle drivetrains and technologies so that if people do wanna hop in a car, more so than ride a bus, um, they're doing so at, at minimal social cost. And that's not gonna happen on its own. It's gonna happen with policy intervention in the form of environmental taxation or um, design standards. I would agree with Nicholas on that. And I just wanna add, I think that we really need to start a very uh, deliberate conversation now about um, the cost of telecommunications. We've often talked about the cost of energy Mm -hmm. um, and bearing the full cost, as you say, of, of um, um, uh, fuel and uh, changing behavior that way. Telecommunications is, uh, this is the, the one industry that I think I can safely point to in this time that is making money hand over fist um, uh, in their um, services. So even if we're able to provide uh, telecommunication services, fiber services to every corner of our city, um, unless we're able to, to address head on um, the cost that those private companies are um, levying upon uh, individual households, 
again, the infrastructure may be there, but the ability to access it may not be. And that really is something I think we need to begin talking about um, how, if we are going to move toward uh, increased remote telework, um, work for all people that are able to in our, in our community because it is sustainable, because it lowers the transportation costs, because of all kinds of good outcomes, we need to make sure that we lower those barriers of entry um, to those, those telecommunication services. Thank you. I, I, we have a lot of good questions coming in. Um, actually, Ray Gastille has a question and Ray, we're gonna try something. I'm gonna put you, I'm gonna allow you to talk and ask your question. So this is our test for today. Oh, have I caught Ray at a place? And that's not going to work. Yes, 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 it works. Oh, wait, good, good. Ray, can you ask us your question, please? Button fast enough. Yeah. <laughs> and listen, it's an obvious question. I know you guys are thinking about it. And, and in a way, Nick answered a little bit of it. But it's like, the CDC literally said, we recommend that you incentivize people driving alone to work. Even <laughs> free parking, uh, benefits for even benefits for not doing ride share, and you know this for people that have worked on transportation demand management for decades. It's like it's the whole world has turned upside down. And I I know there's no good short term answer because we have to you know we can choose to trust the CDC that they actually have good ideas about preserving uh, individual health. But at the same time, I wondered if any of the panelists, since you are all thinking about this, have what would you say to the CDC? Uh, if you were sitting there uh, today about about that. Thank you, Ray. Uh, I might start with suggesting why the underlying health conditions um, of the, the vulnerable communities are so so low, such that they are extremely vulnerable when they when they do use these shared mobility options. We need to address that really baseline community health issue. Um, that, that we need for the next pandemic and the, and the one after that uh, as well. I mean, obviously that CDC guidance is uh, to say disheartening is an understatement, uh, crushing um, for many of us. Um, I, hopefully it will not lead uh, to Katrina's points of long-term behavioral change um, that people you know, start to think of transit as being something that they should stay away from. Um, uh, but you know, we need to make to make it safe. We need to make it safe um, so that people have greater health resiliency um, when they are um, using those modes. That's not the right answer, but but there is that fundamental uh, issue that they are coming into the situation more vulnerable um, than really they, they should be. Um, Any other comments to that question? Katrina? Nick, you look like Nick. Yeah. Go ahead, please. I definitely have something to say, but I wanted to. Have Katrina, if you want to go first. I can, I'll say mine fast if you want. Okay. No, I, I was just going to say, you know, I, I wingman Karina on that question. To me, the, it was so frustrating to see that statement come out and just have the word single, single rider cars even be as part of it. Um, I know many of us on, the, on this phone call are enthusiastic supporters of different mobility options. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that I lasted an entire year when I first moved back to Pittsburgh without a car including through winter, um, relying on my electric bike, if you will. Um, and especially in regards, I think, to these time periods, we know that, that car ownership is actually something that's directly related to, the, uh, to a lot of the fairness and opportunities that are related around jobs. A lot of, a lot of households actually can't afford even having um, single rider cars. So pointing to that as a solution, I think, was further exclusive of actually a lot of the, the problems that we've been faced over the past couple of weeks. So if we can just encourage, I think, um, of course, you know, a, a pandemic is something we need to be concerned about, but thinking about the more dynamic um, options, walkability, bikeability, um, was something that I, I was quite shocked not to see in part of that comment, to be honest. Nick, go ahead. Yeah, I would just say that um, really the, the, the directive or the comment or whatever it was from CDC is, is zeroing in on one risk and completely ignoring others. And it's not terribly surprising that that would be the case, both because of the domain of, of CDC and because of other things that CDC has said or done recently. Um, I would feel a lot less upset about that statement if the, the vehicle choices and uh, fuels reflected full social cost. They don't. And so you're really misallocating resources 
both in terms of purchase and use decisions when that when that directive comes out. Thank you. So we have a few other questions that are coming in. Um, and one of them is actually related to something that, that we have planned to talk about, which is uh, at the end of this, wh where do we think we're going to be? Are we going to be um, after this initial crisis? Are we going to be carbon plus, carbon minus? Um, do we think that these impacts, and this is the question, as businesses uh, resort new normal operations, are we gonna expect air quality and all these other environmental impacts to be worse than when we started? Nick, that's a Nick question. <laughs> um, I, I, my hunch is that we'll be carbon minus, but I don't think we'll be carbon minus by a lot. Um, you know, uh, both Karina and Katrina have articulated in the transportation and, and built environment spheres reasons why we might rebound beyond where we were. Um, my sense is there's a lot of non-essential business travel that was contributing to CO2 emissions uh, via aviation that might never come back. Um, and that's a non-trivial wedge that we would have to overtake through some of these other means. I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about that, but my, my sense is, is mildly carbon minus. Um, one other point that hasn't come up um, very much is during this stretch from uh, early March until now, we've had periods in the center of the United States where uh, wind generation has comprised over 70% of total output for some of the NERC regions. These are big swaths of the country. Um, and that just demonstrates the viability of the technology, the ability of it to meet load needs at, uh, up for a large share and it, it really goes a long way to saying it's, it's a, if there are doubters about the viability of those te technologies to, to meet demand reliably, um, that's a really nice piece of evidence that those arguments aren't really that persuasive. And if we can come out of this with that sense, then we're, we're even uh, better suited to, to meet the carbon minus. Trina or Karina? I mean, I, I don't know what I can say about the carbon plus or carbon minus, I do uh, fear that this is going to end up with some, again, uh, some real inequities that are going to be baked in through this time and the impact um, of what's going to happen, the social impacts, regardless of where the carbon ends up, um, are going to be very, very unequally distributed. They already are. Um, and we're not really putting in place the mechanisms to, to fix those right now. Um, you know, my hunch is that we'll probably end up carbon neutral on this. We'll, we'll, we'll bounce right back to where we were and we'll have learned nothing. Um, not to be pessimistic about this, but we'll learn nothing about this exercise. Um, and on top of that, um, we'll have even greater social inequity. We'll put some of our communities even farther behind than when they were when they came into this. We will have lost some of the critical uh, uh, strength of transit that existed before this. Um, and, uh, and have some other consequences. So I, I, I don't want to be pessimistic about it. I think that the, the people that are on this panel and, and on this uh, call are the people that have the ability to really change um, that foundation, but we need to be utterly, utterly plain with ourselves and um, what we need to do with that. So as we go into our last couple of minutes, and, and uh, Katrina, I know you had a response to that, but I want to be sensitive yeah. to time. Um, I do want to think a little bit big picture about planning for the future. So if you just noodle for a minute as I, I'm going to pepper in a question that came in just a second ago. Um, what are some of the things that we should be thinking about locally, regionally, nationally as we plan? What are things that we maybe haven't discussed um, that we want to make sure get out there, whether it's financial models, uh, funding sources, et cetera? Um, because one of the comments that's come in is, is basically to say that a lot of this is being designed as a snapshot in time, but how do we educate the public, private investors and developers that we shouldn't just throw everything out the window? So like evidence is emerging that the spread of COVID is actually much more strongly correlated to car usage. Should we just kill transit and make it only a system of last resort? So big picture thinking is how should we be planning? How should we be educating the public? And wh what do people need to know to make the right decisions? Those are big questions right at the end, but the hope is that you all might impart a bit of wisdom to, uh, to the end of the conversation. Who would like to go first? I, 
I actually don't mind to just because you used my favorite word plan in it, which I think is the crux of these issues of what we talk about, right? What is our plan for the future? I think, um, you know, the, the tendency in the United States that we have now to think in terms of four, four year returns is, is quite obvious and has become even more so as we've seen kind of the repealing of long term pa- um, plans on things like um, clean power plan, for example. Um, I think it's important, though, to, it, you know, uh, still have an echo of positivity, though, that we have through all of these times, right? Like we, we have been really struggling as a nation, I think, in the past few weeks, and it's devastating to see, but there's several other nations and used to be ourselves who are working towards the sustainable development goals, where, which are exactly um, market signals for us to really align towards our long-term future. I think it's really, um, it can be exciting to, to think about specifically how those issues can be drilled down into the local level. And I think it's even more important than ever than we realize that we have a fundamental mission and need to align our social, environmental, and economic goals and to be able to do that in an immediate instance. So if anything, I think the past few weeks have shown us that no matter what happens in sort of a centralized governance manner, that's important for all stakeholders to to really align towards the future that we know we need, that we've been scientifically analyzing for over 50 years and planning towards. Uh, Nick, Karina. I'll go ahead just briefly. Um, You know, Anna, you use the phrase uh, educate and um, I'm deeply pessimistic of the ability to educate the, the large number of stakeholders that are involved here with the problem, both those that are alive currently and those that don't have any direct input on the current decisions, but that will incur some of the effects. In light of that, I, I really think the solution needs to price the social cost, whether it's explicit or through regulatory means, right? Whether we're talking about technology standards, whether we're talking about carbon taxation, um, as an economist, you know, there are other views that are certainly legitimate, but as an economist, it's, it's the incentives that come through relative costs of choices that matter in terms of how people behave. And if we can roughly align private and public or private and social value through the regulatory um, system, that's, to me, that's how it's gonna happen. Excellent. Yeah. And Karina. I, well, I will just say that it's, you know, this has been a um, devastating impact through all of this. Certainly, um, uh, public revenues are uh, in shambles. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the resources available for public investment um, in infrastructure is a fraction uh, it was a fraction of what we would have liked it to be before, and it's and it's just a, a very small sliver of that now. Um, so those investments that we are going to make, um, we really need to be um, so much more deliberate and thoughtful in the criteria that we're using about where um, that investment goes and for whom um, uh, that benefit is accruing. Um, and what, again, what kind of future we're building um, with this to the, to the question of, you know, should transit be um, only a mode of, of last resort. Um, obviously, no, it, it shouldn't be. But when we are needing to uh, really uh, look at who do we serve first, you know, where do we start? It is building that scaffolding under the most vulnerable in our population so that we can get them, you know, build them up and make sure that they have that safety net. That's what we cannot allow um, to fall apart. Um, hopefully we can build it back again to to this place where we all want to go, but in the near future, it is really going to be needing to make some very, very difficult decisions um, about infrastructure investments, and those in, those decisions are going to need to align with our values um, for, for climate, our values for social equity, um, and our values for, for resiliency. So it is, it's getting very, very real um, right now, which perhaps is a good thing, um, because it, it forces us to face these questions head on, um, where in, in times of plenty, um, we can talk about them and, and maybe not need to address them quite so clearly. 
Uh, thank you all for your comments today. I think that's a, a really great place for us um, to stop for now. Um, obviously, it's a much larger conversation. This uh, session has been recorded. Uh, we will have it on our website. Um, and as a part of our after survey, which we'll be sending to you, um, we'll include a link so that you all can see it. Um, we appreciate all of the comments. We were not able to get to every single question today, but we have those um, and can make sure that they are um, addressed and answered through future conversations. I want to thank our panelists again today, um, Nick Muller, Karina Ricks, Katrina Kelly Pitu. Um, we certainly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules um, to have this conversation and look forward uh, to maybe being in person again where we can talk about it and continue. Glad so thank you here. again, everyone. Um, much appreciated and have a good day. Thanks. Thanks for having us.